She was the first female aviator to fly solo across the Atlantic Ocean and holds many other records. In addition to her flying achievements, Earhart was instrumental in promoting commercial air travel and was instrumental in founding the 99s, an organization for women pilots. Four years later, in 1932, Earhart accomplished the remarkable feat of solo spaceflight aboard the Lockheed Vega 5B, becoming the first woman to do so. After attempting to become the first woman to complete a round-the-world flight in a Purdue-funded Lockheed model 10E Electra in 1937, Earhart and pilot Fred Noonan disappeared in the Central Pacific near Howland Island. The couple was last seen on July 2, 1937, in Ley, New Guinea, the last stop before Howland Island and one of the last legs of their journey. In 1907, Edwin Earhart was doing well when he moved to Des Moines, Iowa, where he became a billing clerk for the Rock Island Railroad. The following year, at age 10, Earhart met her first airplane at the Iowa State Fair. Despite her father's attempts to convince her to fly, Earhart found the plane in poor condition, citing rusty wiring and wooden fittings. The family was finally reunited in Des Moines in 1909, and the Earhart siblings started public school for the first time, with 12-year-old Amelia starting the seventh grade. Earhart graduated from Hyde Park High School in Chicago in 1916. Despite the challenges she faced as a child, she remained determined to succeed in her career. She actively collected newspaper articles about women leaders in male-dominated professions, including film directing, law, advertising, management, and engineering. Initially, he enrolled in college at the Ogontz School in Rydal, Pennsylvania, but did not complete the program. He then joined the Volunteer Support Department at Spadina Military Hospital, where he was responsible for preparing special meals for patients in the kitchen and dispensing prescribed medications at the clinic. While in the hospital, Earhart had the opportunity to hear stories from military pilots, which sparked her interest in aviation. The chronic sinusitis she suffered greatly affected Earhart's flight and her subsequent career. He asked his father Edwin to ask about flying and flying lessons. Earhart's first class was held on January 3, 1921, at Kinnerfield, west of Long Beach Boulevard and Tweedy Road, in what is now the center of the South Gate. After landing solo, he invested in a new leather jacket. Earhart achieved the world record for female pilot on October 22, 1922, by flying the airster at an altitude of 4,300 meters, or 14,000 feet. As a result, when there was no chance to recover from her injuries on the plane, Earhart decided to buy the Canary. Another plane Kinner sells is the Kissel Gold Bug Speedster. He found a two-seater car that he called the Yellow Peril. At the same time, Earhart's sinus infections worsened, and in early 1924, she was hospitalized after a botched operation. Despite several business ventures, including founding a photography company, Earhart eventually took a new direction. After his parents' divorce in 1924 caused his mother to enter the Yellow Peril, a journey from California through the western United States to Banff, Alberta. While in Medford, Massachusetts, Earhart continued her passion for aviation and joined the Boston chapter of the American Aeronautical Society, eventually being elected vice president. After Charles Lindbergh flew in 1927, Amy Guest expressed her desire to become the first woman to fly across the Atlantic Ocean. However, he decided that the trip was too risky for him, and decided to support the project instead, saying that he would find another good-looking girl. In April 1928, while at work, Earhart received a call from Captain Putnam, who interviewed Earhart and asked to join pilot Wilmer Stultz and pilot pilot Louis Gordon on the flight. Most of the flights were instrument-flown, and Earhart did not fly an airplane due to her lack of training for such flights. Earhart later sold the plane, returned it to the United States, and received an unlicensed pilot plate, 7,083. Upon their return to the United States on July 6th, Airmen Stoltz, Gordon, and Earhart were honored with a ribbon-cutting ceremony under Manhattan's Canyon of Heroes, followed by a reception with President Calvin Coolidge at the White House. During that time, Putnam actively promoted himself in a number of ways, including 
publishing a book he had written, organizing new speaking tours and launching a sponsored marketing campaign for products such as luggage, Lucky Strike cigarettes, and women's clothing. Active Living Her authorized clothing line reflects the modern style of Earhart, who used to sew her own clothes. He also invested time and money in establishing the Ludington Airline, the first airline between New York and Washington, D.C. Earhart also served as vice president of National Airways, where she managed Boston, Maine Airways and other airlines. Eastern Airlines Although Earhart became famous for her Trans-Pacific flight, Earhart left her mark. In August 1928, Earhart flew Avian Flight 7083, becoming the first woman to fly across the North American continent and back. In 1930, Earhart became a member of the National Aeronautical Association and actively campaigned for national records and competitions for women. The Federation Aeronautique Internationale, FAI, plays an important role in the adoption of international standards. During this time, Earhart became heavily involved with the 99s, a group of female pilots dedicated to encouraging and promoting the role of women in aviation. Earhart was a strong supporter of women aviators, and when the women failed to win the Bendix Trophy in 1934, she refused to fly movie star Mary Pickford to Cleveland to start the program's competition. Earhart had a progressive view of marriage, advocating equal responsibilities between spouses, and decided to keep her own name instead of Mrs. Mrs. Putnam. Amelia said, the New York Times, when I insisted on a traditional title, he just laughed. Thus, Putnam also accepted the title of Mr. Earhart. The couple did not honeymoon because Earhart was busy promoting Autogyros with a nine-day cross-country tour sponsored by Beech Nut Chewing Gum. These sons were the explorer and writer David Binney Putnam and George Palmer Putnam Jr. Earhart remained close to David. David often visited his family home on the grounds of the Apawamis Club in Rye, New York, his goal was to fly to Paris in a Lockheed Vega 5B single-engine plane to repeat Charles Lindbergh's solo flight five years earlier. After a 14-hour, 56-minute flight filled with strong northerly winds, freezing weather, and mechanical problems, Earhart landed in a field in Culmore, north of Derry, Northern Ireland. On January 11, 1935, Earhart reached a major milestone when she became the first female astronaut to fly solo from Honolulu, Hawaii, to Oakland, California. Unlike previous attempts by others, including the ill-fated Dole Air Race of 1927, which flew in opposite directions, Earhart's first flight was natural and uneventful. Later that year, Earhart took to the skies again in a Lockheed Vega jet nicknamed Old Bessie the Fire Horse. On April 19th, he boarded a solo flight from Los Angeles to Mexico City, after this successful feat, his next record-breaking attempt was to fly non-stop from Mexico City to New York. But in 1935, Earhart found herself constrained by the limitations of her long-distance Pretty Little Red Riding Hood. After the fire, the couple decided to move to the West Coast, where Putnam took a new job as chairman of the editorial board of Paramount Pictures in North Hollywood. California in late 1934. In 1934, Earhart tried the Hollywood slowdown. Pilot Paul Mance expressed a desire to approach him with the goal of improving his flying skills, especially in long-distance flights with Vega aircraft. The school which Mance operated through United Air Services was located at Burbank Airport, about five miles from Earhart's Toluca Lake home. In 1935, Earhart became a visiting professor at Purdue University, guiding women in career choices and serving as a technical advisor to the Department of Aeronautics. In early 1936, Earhart began planning a round-the-world flight, the longest ever attempted at the time, a distance of 47,000 kilometers along the equator. Earhart called the twin-engine plane a flying laboratory. The aircraft was built at Lockheed's facility in Burbank, California, and then stored at United Air Services in Mance, near the Lockheed plant. Although Electra was promoted as a flying laboratory, 
the primary purpose of the flight was to further Earhart's goal of circumnavigating the Earth and generating material for an upcoming book. Manning, who previously captained the ship that brought Earhart from Europe in 1928, was an expert in navigation, navigation, and Morse code. Fred Noonan was selected as an associate because of his ties to the Los Angeles aviation community. Noonan is a licensed sea captain, specializing in ocean and air navigation, who previously worked for Pan Am. He was instrumental in establishing the China Clipper seaplane route and training sailors for the San Francisco Manila route. Noonan was originally scheduled to fly from Hawaii to Howland Island before Manning accompanied Earhart to Australia, and Earhart would continue on for the rest of the trip. Along with Earhart and Noonan, Harry Manning and Mance, who served as Earhart's technical advisor, were also on the plane. Electra will be transferred to the U.S. Navy's Luke Field on Ford Island in Pearl Harbor. Three days later, the planes returned from Luke Field, with Earhart, Noonan, and Manning on board, heading for Howland Island in the Pacific Ocean. Manning, being the only experienced radio operator, decided to use radio direction finding to locate the island. Some witnesses, including Associated Press reporter Luke Field, reported seeing a tire blow out, but Earhart believed either the Electra's right tire had blown or the device had fallen. After extensive damage to the aircraft, the flight was canceled, and the Electra was taken by sea to the Lockheed Burbank facility for repairs. This left Earhart and Noonan with the rest of the crew, none of whom knew how to operate a radio. While the Electra was being repaired, Earhart and Putnam received funds and prepared for a second test. Fred Noonan was the only flight attendant with Earhart on this second flight. At 10 a.m. on July 2nd, 1937, Earhart and Noonan took off from Ley Airfield in a heavily loaded Electra. Earhart used part of the aforementioned route for the Oakland-Honolulu leg of her international flight. The segment from Oakland to Honolulu included Earhart, Noonan, Manning, and Mance. The Electra was loaded with 900 gallons of fuel for the short leg from Honolulu to Howland with only Earhart, Noonan, and Manning aboard, but the plane crashed in mid-flight, ending the first international flight attempt. Its last known location was near the Nukumanu Islands, about 800 miles, 700 nautical miles, 1,300 kilometers after liftoff. These ships not only provided a variety of services, including transporting journalists to the island, but were also capable of communication and navigation, the purpose of the cutter was to establish radio communication with Earhart's planes, sending reference radio signals to facilitate locating Howland Island without relying solely on satellite navigation, and radio if Earhart was using a 500 khz transmitter. Thinking is an act of discovery. For Earhart's voice broadcast, she used an experimental high-speed pathfinder and used fog to create a plume of smoke over the horizon. Unfortunately, all of these navigation methods failed to get Earhart to Howland Island. The Electra was equipped with radios for communication and navigation purposes, but the details of these devices are still unclear. Unfortunately, Electra was unable to establish two-way radio communication with USCGC Atasca, 1929, and was not located by radio signals. It is unclear whether the Model 20B receiver contains a beat frequency oscillator that can detect continuous wave transmissions such as Morse code and radio signals. Manning, who participated in the world's first flight attempt but not the second, knew Morse code and received an FCC aeronautical radio telegraphy license for 15 words per minute in March 1937, shortly before the first flight. The Hooven radio compass has been replaced by a Bendix combination device which allows the current loop antenna to be connected to a collector, Western Electric 20B. Alternatively, the antenna can be connected to a Bendix RA1 receiver capable of 1500 kHz resolution. However, it is unclear whether these carriers have been installed, and if so, may be removed prior to flight. According to Elgin and Marie Long, Joe Gurr trained Earhart to use a Bendix receiver and other equipment to tune into KFI radio at 640 kHz and determine direction. Regardless of the receiver used, here is a photo of Earhart's wireless directional antenna with a five-band Bendix connector. 
According to Elgin and Marie Long, the combined device applied the RDF-1B circuit to the RA-1 receiver, and the system was limited to frequencies below 1430 kHz. When it attempted the world's first flight from Honolulu to Howland with Manning as pilot, Itasca had to transmit a CW guidance signal at 375 kHz or 500 kHz. Earhart failed to locate a 7,500 kHz radio signal at least twice during her round-the-world flight. If the RDF tools are not suitable for that period, it is considered an operator error and has no effect. Darwin's radio station was waiting to hear from Earhart when she arrived, but assumed a broken tube had caused the RDF to fail. Despite trying to listen for radio signals during test flights at Ley, Earhart failed to pick up the RDF signal. Near Howland Island, Earhart reported picking up a 7,500 kHz signal from Itasca, but was unable to determine the RDF signal. On the second international flight, radio problems were discovered while flying over the United States. Pan Am technicians may have modified the ventral antenna while the plane was in Miami. Broadcast quality issues were observed on 6,210 kHz in Ley. It wasn't until 2.18 p.m., four hours after liftoff from Ley, that a radio message arrived on 6,210 kHz, Earhart's daytime frequency. Ley's last reception was a strong signal at 17.18, and nothing came after that. Perhaps the plane was switched to 3,105 kHz, Earhart's night frequency. Itasca heard Earhart at 3,105 kHz, but not at 6,210 kHz. Tighar reports that the Electra's antenna was scratched while en route to the runway at Ley, causing it to lose the ability to receive HF transmissions. USCGC Itasca stayed at Howland to arrange communications with Earhart's Electra and help guide them to the island upon their arrival. The last attempt at radio navigation to Howland Island failed due to many errors and mistakes. Fred Noonan highlighted the problems with the accuracy of radio wayfinding and navigation. Near Howland, Earhart was able to send a transmission from Itasca on 7,500 kHz, but could not establish the frequency, so the direction to Itasca could not be determined. A reasonable explanation is that Earhart's RDF equipment did not operate at 7,500 kHz because most RDF equipment at the time was not designed to operate above 2,000 kHz. If the antenna is used beyond the specified frequency, directionality will be lost. According to some reports, Earhart was unaware of the navigation system installed on the plane shortly before takeoff. The system consisted of new Bendix receivers operating in five wavelength bands, labeled one through five. When Earhart and Noonan arrived at Howland Island, Itasca received power. Earhart's clear audio is K-H-A-Q-Q. -Q. At 6.14 a.m., another call was received stating that the plane was 320 kilometers, 200 miles away, and that the ship was asked to use signals to indicate its location. It was then that the radio operators on the Itasca realized that their RDF system could not tune into the aircraft's 3,105 kHz frequency. Radio man Leo Bellarts later mentioned that he was sitting there sweating blood because I couldn't do a darn thing about it. A similar request for a bearing was made at 6.45 a.m., when Earhart estimated they were 100 miles, 160 kilometers away. KHAQQ, Earhart's plane, CLNG Itasca, we must be on you, but cannot see you, but gas is running low. Been unable to reach you by radio. We are flying at a 1,000 feet. Earhart's transmission at 7.58 a.m. stated that she couldn't hear the Atasca and requested voice signals to attempt a radio bearing. The Atasca reported this transmission as the strongest possible signal, indicating that Earhart and Noonan were nearby. Earhart acknowledged receiving these signals, but couldn't determine their direction. Wait. However, shortly after, she returned to the same frequency, 3,105 kHz, with a transmission that was recorded as questionable. We are running on line north and south. 
Earhart's transmission suggested that she and Noonan believed they had reached Howland's designated position, which was actually about five nautical miles, ten kilometers off. It is unclear whether any radio signals were received from Earhart and Noonan after their deaths. Earhart and Howland's voice communications used a frequency of 3,105 kHz, which is prohibited by the FCC for aerial use in the United States. The last voice message received on Howland Island from Earhart indicated that she and Noonan were traveling through Howland on a special route calculated by Noonan. After communications with Howland Island were lost, efforts were made to establish communications using voice and Morse code transmissions. Pacific and American operators could see signs of the downed Electra, but the signals were weak and indistinct. Pan American Airways stations detected signals from several locations, including Gardner Island, Nikumaroro, about 580 kilometers to the SSE. It turns out that if this signal was from Earhart and Noonan, they should have been on the ground with the plane, because the water would have caused electrical problems in the Electra. Clues came days after the disappearance, but nothing was clear. The captain of the USS Colorado later reported that several stations were trying to contact Earhart's plane on that frequency, using voice messages and signals. About an hour after Earhart's last message, the USCGC Itasca began a search operation north and west of Howland Island, with no results. The United States Navy USN quickly joined the search, deploying available resources to the search area near Howland Island for three days. The first search made by Itasca was to follow the 157-337 baseline from Howland Island to the NNW. Several radio transmissions from Earhart led to a separate search along the 281 degree near West Line from Howland Island, but no trace of the navigator was found. On July 6, 1937, four days after Earhart's last radio transmission, the captain of the battleship Colorado received orders from the commander of the 14th Naval District to take over the organization of all Navy and Coast Guard units for the purpose of coordinating. Search operations. Subsequent searches focused on Phoenix Island, located south of Howland Island. A week after the disappearance, Colorado Navy planes conducted an aerial survey of several islands in the group, including Gardner Island, now known as Nikumaroro, which had been uninhabited for more than 40 years. A later report on Gardner Island stated that although signs of current occupation were found, no response was received from residents despite frequent rounds and visits to the area. It is believed that if Miss Earhart had her chance, Miss Earhart could have landed from the plane in the canyon and then swam and walked to land. In addition, the shape and size of Gardner Island recorded on the charts was found to be inaccurate. Additional Navy search efforts have been directed to the north, west, and southwest of Howland Island, assuming that the Electra had hit the sea and was still afloat, or that operators are using emergency rates. It was also influenced by those worried about the opportunity to find an American champion in the media. Despite the efforts of the U.S. Navy and Coast Guard, no physical evidence of Earhart, Noonan, or Electra 10E was found. After the official search, Putnam funded a special search by local authorities in the Pacific Islands and nearby waters, focusing on the Gilbert family. In the United States, Putnam acted as administrator of Earhart's estate to pay for the search and related expenses.